And we, would, we just want to thank all of you guys for uh, you know co the constant uh, con contributions that you do, the strength of the community. Uh, month after month, we've just been seeing not only the attendance for each of our uh, events, but also the overall uh, membership grow you know, to over 2,500 now, uh, ranked number sixth in the world uh, for activity, believe it or not. So give your all hands round applause, pat stuff on the back, that's all about you guys. You know, Boston truly believes in community, in advancing not only the knowledge, but then sharing that, right, to accelerate the amount of knowledge that we can, we can push out there. Uh, the thing is, we come together to try to solve problems for not only each other, but others in the field, uh, so we advance together. Um, and you know that couldn't be done without all of you guys constantly helping, constantly uh, putting in to volunteer, putting in presentations, and you know being contributors like Chewy in hosting events like this. So, you know, big round of applause to the folks at the Chewy team. Thank you so much. Putting this together, reach out. Uh, VP of Engineering in the back, if you guys ever have any questions. If you're from Chewy, please put your hand in the air. Because um, I know there's a lot of excitement and energy about what you guys are doing. Um, so look around. If you guys have any questions about you know, the direction, the team growth, what they're looking to do, what type of teams they have, you'll hear a lot about that. But you'll know there's different representation around the room. All right? So to, to kick it off, we have a few um, few announcements that we want to make um, just about what's going on in the community. Uh, I want to roll through them quickly. Uh, that way, that, you know, we can really get on to why we're here. All right, announcements. Uh, next month, we're going to be having uh, our DevOps uh, meetup over at Robin Software, which is right across the street. Um, and we're going to be doing workshops and tutorials. This is something that we set up in the Slack channel uh, on the Mentor Mentee. Um, really got a lot of traction. We have a lot of new members in our community that are really interested in some of the um, technical uh, challenges that are happening. Uh, they want to get themselves, you know, um, you know uh, in understanding like different environments. So we're going to be doing like a, you know Jenkins work, uh, workshop, um, some Docker uh, 101. Um, maybe you want to look look at Terraform, Ansible. We're going to be bringing people um, from the community to basically lead the courses, uh, and it's going to be working workshops. So that's going to be at Robin Software, uh, June 24th, right across the street. Um, please, please, we're looking for uh, anyone who's interested in being a mentor for um, teaching. Hit us up in the Slack channel, and we're going to get everything confirmed and get it uploaded, all right? And for anyone interested in a specific topic or tech uh, technical skill set, Please hit us up in the Slack channel as well because we definitely want to know, you know, what uh, what workshops are going to resonate, what are going to be the most valuable uh, to the folks in our community. So uh, I got pinged by the, the folks at DevOps Days, uh, DevOps.com. Um, so Jenkins Day, June twelfth, they're having their uh, conference. I don't know if you guys have been to the CI uh, Jenkins Days uh, at the Loft last year. They had it. We have 10 free tickets. It's going to be first come, first serve, and we also have 50% uh, off. I'm going to also post that into the Slack channel along with a link for free tickets. If you guys are interested, come see me. You know, I'll pop you in an email, get you in there. Uh, we, the Boston DevOps community, will have a table doing, you know, doing our thing, trying to grow out uh, more, uh, more awareness. All right. Um, I didn't see Kathy come in, but Kathy pinged me on the uh, meetup. She's got two Red Sox tickets she wanted to give away. Um, so if you guys are interested, uh, you know I can connect you with her. She'll, she'll get them sent over to you. Um, all right, hey, Summer Social. Uh, we're we're going to be bringing that back in August. August 31st at uh, 50 Milk Street. So you guys understand what the social mixer is. One of the big things we do all, all year round is we, we have a lot of uh, uh, presentations, technical in nature, uh, cultural. Um, we do uh, a lot of work in collaboration, um, conflict management, things of that nature. Once a year, we want to provide a social setting, mixer, for relationship building. People that you know are familiar faces, but maybe haven't had the opportunity to really you know, get to know. 
In August, this is what we're doing. We're gonna have a member from Toastmasters come in, talk about some of the, uh, um, some of the EQ um, values of you know, being in a community. If you're, if you're not comfortable going up and just introducing yourself, they'll be able to provide you some, some exercises to practice. The idea is, in, in the whole DevOps methodology, right? Empathy and, and collaboration and communication are key. Okay, these are the soft skills that we talk about, um, which are most of the times dismissed because it's not hard teaching. Like it's not black and white. These are these are skills you need to develop over time. We as a community, you know, if we're not focusing on how to how to hone those skills and, and better you as a as an individual, then you know what are we really contributing? So this is the one time uh, through the year where we start to give. Uh, give you guys best practice, give you ideas, and then we, we really try to give you a, a comfortable, um, familiar setting to practice some of these, uh, some of these exercises. I am looking for sponsors um, because you know, what we're gonna be doing is it's, it's gonna have food, beverages, and basically open spaces. Um, we're, we'll, we're looking for five sponsors. Uh, the total cost will be uh, $1,000, but you'll, have, you'll be able to have a table, you'll be able to represent, uh, talk about what your company is doing, talk about what teams are building, um, and really, it's really showing a commitment and a contribution back into our community. Uh, so please come talk to me if you are interested in getting that brand awareness and really um, helping strengthen, uh, you know, strengthen our, our community. DevOps Days Boston, so everybody knows, um, Please, organizers, raise your hand. If you guys look around, uh, we have um, core organizers here for DevOps Days Boston. Um, the site is up. The CFPs are open um, from Paper IO. Uh, September 17th and 18th, Psychorama. 18th, 19th? Sorry, okay. You know, that's <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's. Okay, so 17th, 18th, 19th, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Um, go to the site, devopsstage.org slash Boston. You can check it out. Any questions you have, again, raise your hand, organizers. Please visit one of these folks. They'll be able to give you a lot of information. Um, so that's, that's one thing. Um, Kathy, you wanna come up real quick, talk about uh, the tickets you have? All right, Kathy is here. Big round of applause for Kathy. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I was late. Um, but I did want to say, um, and Dave, I don't know how you want to give them away, but what? But but obviously you've got to be able to go if this is going to have value. So <laughs> these specifics are Seattle Mariners versus the Red Sox, Saturday, May 27th. It's a 4.05 p.m. game. Naturally, it's at Fenway. So, how do you propose we, we find the most worthy recipient of this amazing <laughs> citizenship in Red Sox Nation? How should we do that? What do you guys think? Hey, we're, we're all about collaboration. He's the biggest Red Sox fan I know. No. <laughs> oh, he's a mentor. Well, that's that's very good. I like that idea, right? We're looking for volunteers, obviously, for mentors um, in the mentor um, and mentee Slack channel. But this is what we'll do. After we're doing a uh, Q&A panel afterwards, um, so what we can do is we'll we'll do a uh, random drawing at that time. Find out, you know. So if you're interested. You know, throw your card in, and then we'll do a, a, a quick raffle and get those out to you guys, all right? So, Kathy, thank you so much. That's wonderful. All right, my shout out to our, our, our sponsor for this wonderful space for, you know, really making that happen in, in a quick turnaround. I, I don't want to even give you guys the story, um, but the, the Chewy team, Basically, came to came to uh, came to our assistance, and all they said was yes, Dave, whatever you need, yes. So Mishka, the Chewy team, please raise your hand again. Thank you very much. We're very very honored and humbled to be in uh, this wonderful location. All right. 
Now that brings us up to our topics. All right. DevOps structures and topologies. One of the big things that, that we talk about, um, you know, in the industry is just DevOps, and it has so many faces and so many uh, nuances that we like to think of it more as a thought process or a workflow or a framework. Um, you know, our community really hates the term DevOps engineer. What does that mean? You know, it's like. Well, how do you figure out what that means, right? Because they're, depending on your business objectives, the, the historical uh, um, scarring within an organization, uh, some, of the, some of the political games, some of the, the compliance issues, for each organization, you know, the concepts look a little bit different. It's really the overall core objectives. Um, that's what we're here to talk about today, right? So one thing for baseline terminology that I, I really wanted to bring to the table, and this is one thing I, I really have a hard time to struggle with when going into organizations and talking about their, their, uh, their need to grow out like their DevOps teams or their high performance teams. We start to talk about culture. So we all understand, when we talk about culture, we talk about DevOps culture. We're not talking about company culture. Like if you're, if I'm asking, hey, what's the culture like, you know, at X, Y, and Z, I, I, I don't care if you're sitting on bean bags, if it's open spaces, if it's this or that. That's your company culture. What we care about, do you have self-organized teams? Do you guys really believe in failing fast and failing forward? Is there transparency within the organization across different departments? Do you understand the value stream mapping within your organization? Where are the constraints? Are you, are you focused in, in communicating that throughout the organization? Are your teams empowered? How are you handling your technical debt? Don't tell me you don't have it. If you were a recruiter, building a team out, when somebody asks you, what is their culture? I'm gonna start with you guys. Get these answered. And if your manager doesn't know how to answer these questions, probe. Keep it coming, because I'm gonna tell you something. The teams, the organizations that are transparent and able to answer these will get the brightest, the best talent out there. And we are talking about the highest demand in the technical space. We all know it. It starts right here in clear, transparent communication about where you are as an organization, where you're going, and how you're gonna do it. The business objectives per employee are clear. Obviously, each person needs to know how they attribute value and where they stand from the top to the bottom. All right, so these are the things that, you know, we want, I just wanted to make sure I kind of defined out there, you know, as, as, as a uh, kind of a platform to start to launch us into our first talk, all right? So, I want to first call up our, uh, our first presenter, Chuck. Chuck is from Pivotal, and he's going to be he's going to be talking a little bit about uh, some some interesting things that are going to touch on a lot of areas. And uh, so, without further ado, want to introduce Chuck as he gets his uh, slide deck set up. Before State Street, and it was startups. So I've had a little bit of weird moving around over the last few years. Um, and so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, DevOps and, and the capital E enterprise. Um, 
and Dave stole a little bit of kind of where I was because I was going to talk a lot about how this is something that's cultural um, and that it's really not just about the culture of the organization or the organization. You good here? Yeah. Okay. Um, it's not just the organizational culture, but it's sort of the cultural impact um, and how that culture has impacted us and the decisions that we make about ourselves and what success is. Um, so, in keeping with sort of the theme, right, I have a couple of ideas about what I've seen be successful and not, right, it, and it's pretty much what they had to say, right? You got to know the value stream. If you do not map your value stream, um, you're not going to know uh, exactly what you're doing, right? You're going to do things like take your operations team and rename it DevOps and think you're done. Um, which we have customers that do that, and um, it's really hard when we talk to them because we're telling them that part of what they have to do as this DevOps team is they have to use development practices and they have to maybe we deliver them some tools and they need to take over those tools as products. Um, and they can't because they're a traditional operations team and I'll, I'll be honest, I started out in operations, um, actually kind of doing both, but operations was more of an interest for me. And someone told me, uh, you know, took me aside and said, your job is to automate yourself out of a job. Right, and I think everyone, and, and you know, we weren't so fancy as to say operations then, we were sysadmins and everybody had or whatever. And everyone who did those jobs back then believed that, right? My job is to automate myself out of, out of a job. And it took until the SRE book came out for everyone to start actually saying, huh, that's what we really should be doing, right? We took our time, we were on call, we were dealing with the fires, we never actually automated ourselves out of the job. We might write a script, you know, the really good people might write more than one script. Um, but, uh, and, and the really great people, the scripts would actually be able to be used beyond the one mistake, right? <laughs> and so, um, but it really, you know, all of those things we knew, but we can't really change from what we became fighting fires unless we understand this, right? So the value stream is really important. Um, the other thing that I think is really important, and we talk about this as much with development teams as other teams, but I think it's important regardless of where you are in the value stream, is to realize that you're building products. Right? You're not delivering projects, you're not providing a service, you're building products. So a big part of what that means from kind of the traditional sense of operations is if there's a ticket, put an API on it. Right? If you need a ticket now and you aren't moving towards putting an API on that, then again, you're not going to get it right. Now, that's Probably to people who are interested in DevOps, that's not a new idea, right? We should automate everything. But there's still a lot of organizations that say, we're the DevOps team. Oh yeah, we'll get to automating that someday, but there's no plan. Now, it doesn't have to be tomorrow. It can be a backlog of changes on that product. And, and really, operational discipline puts you in a good position for this because if you're looking at ITSM and all those things, you were providing a service. And those services are essentially the products of that team. Right? A product doesn't have to necessarily be something tangible, a piece of software. It can be a capability that you give to the organization. It can be the culture, right? I have a, a customer that asked me last week, I'm in the midst of doing transformation here. How do I not transform myself out of the job? Right? Now, this is part of what inspired me. This was around the time I talked to Dave. This, talk, this talk's been percolating for me from a couple of different angles for a while. And it's part of what inspired me to start fairly delivered for the first time today was when he asked me that question. Because if you're looking at yourself as I'm delivering the project of transforming this organization, that has an end. And you are out of the job, right? There's no project manager needed for the transformation once you've transformed. You have to move on to the next project, right? Um, projects are really a bad way of looking at things. Now if you look at it as a product, even something like that, right? So I'm transforming my organization. We talk, we, at Biddle, we talk a lot about cloud native, right? So DevOps is a piece of what we talk about, but our sort of main buzzword and branding around how we're telling people to change is cloud native. So I said to him, you are the product, you, you are the product manager for the product of the cloud native uh, culture and organizational structure at your organization. And that will always exist, right? Products don't go away in the way that products do. They don't have like a, a clear, definitive beginning and end is the way providing a service does in like the ITSM model. Um, so I think delivering a product is a really important part of making the transformation. And 
this is, I stole this slide from someone else, so I'm assuming there's a build that I wasn't aware of. Um, and I wanted to at least talk a little bit about team structure, because it was sort of on what you were promised if you read the uh, introduction to the meetup. <laughs> so, um, and this is the structure of the way that we sort of go into customers and help them understand um, the roles and responsibilities for, again, we talk about a cloud native transformation, right? It's not that much different than a DevOps cultural transformation. It's just that it's approaching it from, you know, we're looking at software architecture as well, we're looking at platforms, and, um, and this is sort of the model that we've come up with, um, where the core ends up becoming sort of this platform operators, right? We, we deliver a platform, so that ends up being the core of how, um, how we interact with an organization uh, in terms of like changing and enabling that. And that then helps people to make other transformations. But I think this applies really across the board. Um, even if you're not looking at you can see some things on here, we talk about PCF in here, because that's that's our platform. Um, not a product pitch, you want to talk to me about it later. Great, I'll buy you here. Right? But um, so um, but it really is, you know, the product managers, right? We have products, we need a product manager, they need to manage the backlog for those pro those products. They need to look at how that product's going to evolve, they need to articulate a vision for that product. Um, we have the owners of the portfolio of products, we have the developers, we have the operators. Um, we tend to look at the SRE model. Um, I have to say I've been not paying as much attention to sort of the, the, the DevOps, Twitterverse, and blogosphere and medium world, but I don't think we argue anymore about DevOps versus SRE, but uh, if we're still arguing about it, I'm sorry for bringing it up. Um, <laughs> but we do, um, we do, you know, we tend to believe in that model because we look at the platform that people are putting in place for development teams to as a product that is being produced. And the people who build that product tend to look like the profile of an SRE. They then build that platform in such a way that the development teams can operate the systems that they've built, the applications and services that they've built provided on that platform. Um, so we really take sort of, you know, that sort of end-to-end, -end, you build it, you own it, and we combine it with a little bit of sort of the SRE concept, and we, and we, we sort of advocate that. So this is a structure that you know tends to work for people who are using our platform, tends to work for people who value the fact that they should have a platform, right? Lots of organizations go out and build a platform. Again, about giving a product page, we talk about that for the next 20 minutes, but we won't today. Um, and so this structure is, a, is one that, that we've seen a lot of success with. But um, unfortunately, this is hard. And it's hard because of the values, the incentives, and the behaviors that we see in large companies. Right, this really becomes a, a psychological, sociological problem more than it's a structural problem. Right, we can draw an org chart that says we're going to embed someone from the team that we call ops in all the development teams, and we're going to say that those teams have new, new accountability, and we're going to say we have DevOps in our organization now. And to some extent, right, if you're looking at checking the boxes, you've kind of done it. You've got that operational excellence in the development team. You've given the development team some responsibility for that operational excellence. Um, you started down that path, but if you don't change the incentives, if you don't change the values, um, then you're not going to succeed because they still have the same behaviors. Um, so, and then when you, you know, I didn't even steal the slide, I just stole that little bottom box. Um, when you steal slides, you get bills that you're not expecting. So, um, so when we think about values, right, and we think about values in industry, we value creative ideas, we value speed to market, disruption, right? We're always talking about disruption and transformation, um, and we value collaboration. But then we look at what are the enterprise values. They value having a competitive edge. They want to deliver value to their shareholders, right? They are they are effectively legally obligated to deliver value to their shareholders, not their beer or coffee conversation. Um, <laughs> they, they do want to keep their employees, but only when it's you know, to their benefit to keep their employees, right? Retention is really important until it's time to cut costs. And, um, and they want to profit. As an employee, you know, we care a lot about our pay and benefits, right? I, I like to think that I want to be happy at work every day, and that's my number one priority. But, you know, I, I, you know when I was 29, and someone asked me if I wanted to consider apprenticing for him to the restaurant because you know how much I love to cook. And I said, with what I'm making today at 29, I can't go back to what a chef makes. Right? Um, so even though I want to be really happy and I love cooking, I, I made that decision, right? Pay and benefits. We want private ownership. Uh, this can be very hard in very collaborative cultures, right? I don't own that anymore. I 
had this tr difficulty with my team at State Street. I started saying, I want you all to understand all the code. Um, and there were people who were scared of that, right? Because, um, and at first I thought they were scared because they're thinking, well, you won't need me anymore. And then I realized they were scared because there was some value and worth they found in being the one that knew that thing, right? So trying to get them to collaborate more was difficult because of the way they were measuring themselves. Um, community spirit, right? We are all at some level tribal, right? We want to find our tribes. We want to be part of our tribes. That's why we like working in teams. Um, and um, I think joy and even hope are things that we really like in our lives, um, even when we're really motivated up here, right? Um, when you talk to, I, mean, I worked with, at, I worked with the trading floor, it's true. Um, and guys on that trading floor were far more financially driven than me, right? I say guys, because quite frankly, they were most of them. Um, and, um, and yet, they took joy in the things that they got with that money, right? So they, somewhere they were looking for some sort of happiness. They weren't always finding it, but they were looking for some sort of happiness. Um, so these are the things that we value. Um, you know, unfortunately, if we look at some of the values that that means, when we look at some of those enterprise values, they're very counter to those individual and those industry values, right? Um, I don't know if, if this book, Does IT Matter, came out of an HBR article called IT Doesn't Matter. Who's familiar with that? Um, so it was quite the stir some years ago. Um, and uh, the whole thing was, you can't get a competitive advantage from information technology. And I will stand here as someone whose company comes out and says, Silicon Valley is a state of mind, and, and come and eat your lunch, and you, know, you need to drive yourself forward with technology. It's absolutely true. IT does not matter at all. It's a commodity. IT is a commodity. But technology matters immensely, right? Whether you have, you know, Exchange or Gmail or Salesforce or you know all these things that are basically capabilities that every organization must have. How fast you patch your servers, right? Um, all of these things are things that everyone's going to do and everyone can catch up to you on, right? Um, but being able to build new things, new products, new business models with technology brought a lot of value forward, right? Unfortunately, this does IT matter? IT doesn't matter thing did cause us to do a lot of de-skilling in big organizations, right? I'm working with a customer right now who um, I asked him, why are the developers you're having us talk with about this new initiative, why do they call themselves the integration scheme? And the honest answer to that question, that this is the work they were doing, the honest answer to that question was, that's the only place we have our own developers left. They outsourced all of the new software development, uh, all the new product development, they outsourced all the operations of their systems. And the people they had left who were, had been their developers were now in management roles. We're going to talk about that shortly. Um, and so they took this team that isn't really necessarily a perfect fit and said, let's see what we can do with these guys. Now, it turns out the people in that team are so excited to have a chance to build interesting, valuable things again that they're going to do a great job. Right? They've been moving data from system to system for one guy, 17 years. Um, but we got them started working on some new things, and they're super excited about that. One guy said, this is a, he, he spent a day in our office trying to get a feel for what it's like to work with them. One of the things we do in our consulting is we pair, with, we pair program with customers to build products. And he came after just an experimental day of pairing, and he said, that's the best day of work I've had in the last 10 years. Um, so unleashing that kind of energy, that's part of why we call developers and team members, right? Um, and so, these, but these two different mindsets are really not compatible. If you look at IT as a cost center and you try to drive those costs out, you're not going to get the value of having developers in your organization. You're not going to get the value of doing anything that looks like, sounds like, feels like DevOps. You need to really look at, are you really seeing value in technology in the organization? Uh, and, you know, if you're in an organization that doesn't see value in technology, you have to ask yourself some hard questions. Um, so, values, of course, lead to incentives. <coughs> Um, <coughs> we see sort of how, as a kind of, I'm fill in that bill again at the bottom there, um, as an industry, there's a lot of things that um, we see as such sort of core incentives. We want to lead in the market, we want to have social impact, we want to strong e economic influence. We want to be recognized by our peers, right? Um, I, you know, I'm up here tonight because I want to be recognized by my peers. I, I have something I thought feels interesting to say. I hope you find it interesting to hear. Um, and I'll feel some great recognition for that if you do. Um, so that's a big motivation. Um, 
company motivations aren't always really aligned with you. Some of them are, right? You the market means you have a high market share, right? Um, influence, press coverage and influence are somewhat related. Um, that earnings one, again, that leads to treating things like cost centers that maybe shouldn't be. Um, and then individually, our incentives are in our bonus plan, are they looking at career growth, they're being recognized as part of our team, or our team being recognized in our, in our self-esteem. Unfortunately, we have these career paths built around an idea of career growth. That means we sort of go from doing stuff. Um, and this was a, a story I heard from uh, Neil Ford from ThoughtWorks. He said that um, men are work is way more interesting than ordinary work. Um, and that was actually the genesis, the very first like bubbles of what this talk, and it's probably where I'm going to take this talk in the future, came from was hearing that statement. Um, we start out, you know, we pull data from a web page and we put it in a database, and then we take out the database and put it on a web page. Right? His terms, not mine. Um, and then we get to build the things that let other people do that. Right? And, and, and then we get to tell people how to build the things that let other people do that. And, um, and you know, when we have this, these paths that are all about sort of like building influence and, and, and maybe being more removed from doing the stuff. Right? Whether it's a management path or a technical path, they both go the same way. You get more removed from doing the stuff that is actually driving the value. Well, we have to really change our mindset away from that being the growth, right? So I had, at State Street, I had um, at one point about 60 developers of different stripes in my team. Before that, I ran a PL as a uh, software startup, a couple of different stuff, software startups. Now I'm an individual contributor to Google, right? My career growth in terms of this type of ladder, right? I went from running a PL to being a middle manager to being an individual contributor, right? It makes no sense for this. But my ability to influence people has grown through a lot of those steps. My ability to like sort of get these things that motivate me has grown through all of those steps. So by shifting my lens, I can look at that same trajectory that quite frankly was failure based on sort of what I was taught a career should look like, um, and realize that I'm quite successful. <laughs> But you know, this type of thing leads to behaviors that make collaboration, make those values and cultures around DevOps that we want very difficult because there's a limited number of spots up here, right? So um, Dave can't succeed if I need to succeed, right, to some extent. Um, if we move to a collaborative culture and we stop trying to climb this ladder, um, we have to define new values of success and new, new, uh, new measures and incentives towards success. So they have behaviors. Um, so those same values and incentives lead to behaviors. Um, the behaviors that we speak to in an, in an industry, we want to collaborate, we want to sell technically, we want to embrace change, we want to fast and forward, all the things, you know, that's the stuff they were talking about before I got up here. Um, Yet, in big companies, we still have a lot of cost containment, command and control, distrust. Right? I think that is the biggest cause of the cultural failures around the things we're talking about tonight. Um, if you do not trust the team to be successful, right? one of the things that I see most around that shows this distrust is segregation of duties. Right? Some people say separation of duties. I have this old Carnegie security guy explained to me that it's always been segregation. People started calling it separation, always get it right. So I always try to say segregation. I have no idea which one's actually right, but he was cranky enough about it that I say segregation. Um, that's all about distrust. But the funny thing is, right, kind of segregation, you are ops, you are a dev, dev can't put things in production. And then the developer leans over the operations person's shoulder and treats them like a human keyboard and tells them what to do to deploy something because they don't know what to do and they don't have that time to understand it. So what kind of control is that? We go and automate all that. We can demonstrate to our auditors a better control, a technical control will always be better to an auditor than a process control. Um, and all we have to do to let that happen is have a little more trust for our staff, behavior that large organizations often have trouble with. Um, and then for self, right, we want to attain goals, we want to climb the ladder, we need to compete with our peers. Hey, competition's fun, right? As long as you keep the right outcome in mind. Right? It's fun, John here, he's, he's actually like boss, but we work at doing some of the same things on accounts. It's fun to have like my part of the talk go a little better than his, right? It's a, it's a fun little thing, you know. Uh, uh, it's it's a it's a fun little <laughs> it's a fun little competitive thing, right? Um, but when it starts to get to you know what, 
John's the boss of New England. I'd like to be the boss of New England. I'm going to undercut John, and it's a problem, right? Um, so one thing I've learned, when I started out uh, in consulting, which I was doing, um, the couple times when I said I ran PL, I was consulting. Um, people taught me as a consultant I had needed to learn how to leverage myself. Right. How did I influence the success of other people based on my knowledge, wisdom, and skills? Um, when I was working in a large organization, it was, how big is your team? How big is your budget? Right? On the ladder, get the big title. Um, if you have a big budget, you have big power, you have a lot of influence. Right? Very different models. If I'm trying to leverage myself, I'm teaching, I'm enabling, I'm instructing. If I'm trying to get a bigger budget, get more staff, I'm fighting. I'm playing games. Very different models for success. Again, if you look at leverage as the value that you care about, you'll do the right. You'll you'll go forward with the right behaviors. Um, and so this one, this slide's a little sort of awkward here in the um, in the visuals. Uh, I said the talk has sort of been percolating for a bit, but I did want to mention this because I think a lot of people have this idea of a center of excellence, right? COE. Um, and it's it's kind of comes from a model of you know kind of that de-skilling that I talked about, right? Um, some things are hard, so we put the people who know how to do that in one place. We call it a center of excellence, and they get to excel at that stuff. Um, and I, I don't think this is always wrong, um, but I think the difference is building up that excellence in that thing should be about enabling everybody else. Right? Again, that becomes consistent with the cultural factors we're talking about. Um, so. I sort of tweaked this idea of center of, enable, of center of excellence and said, what if those become centers of enablement? All right, so they, they increase leverage in that way. They enable other teams to be successful. They build products for those teams to be successful. Um, they share their knowledge. They, they advocate for their ideas. Um, and they, they help the organization succeed in that way instead of sort of holding in all that expertise. Because in reality, that model of sort of creating that center of excellence should always have been about that becoming the way we do things. But because of all the things we did to de-skill, it couldn't be. So um, it's just, just a few thoughts to me on how sort of the, the decisions we make that are really outside of you know, what do we adopt, how do we, how do we, who has the picture, who's in the team, what automation do we use, right? It's influenced a lot by how we're motivated, how we think about our success, how we think about our organization's success. Thanks, Chuck. I had some questions. So next up, Mohit, are you ready? Yeah. Next up is Mohit from Localytics, and I need to read what you're going to talk to me about. <coughs> oh, awesome. So you're going to talk about the evolution of the Localytics team. So give it up for Mohit. I'll let him take it away. talk about the localytics, uh, the evolution of the localytics engineering team. So before I go into that piece, just want to tell you a little bit about localytics. Uh, we are a mobile app marketing uh, platform. Uh, we enable customers like CVS, Grindr, uh, HBO. We, 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 give, we give them the ability to actually message their customers and uh, through to their mobile devices and uh, send them either in-app or push messages. And uh, so it's a really interesting big data challenge and it's, it's fun to work on and so, and we're also hiring. <laughs> oh, FYI. Let's throw that in there. <laughs> hold, All right. Hold the mic behind. Okay, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. The most important thing I said is we're hiring. 
<laughs> okay, um, so I have a, I feel like I have a unique perspective uh, about uh, local Linux and startups in general. Um, I started as the eighth person on the local Linux team uh, six years ago. And so since then, there's been a lot of growth. Um, there's been growth in the team. Uh, we have, we're up to 130 people. Uh, growth in the number of customers and the, and the amount of data that we're ingesting. Um, growth in the product offering. So it's been a, an interesting ride. In addition to some growth, you know, we've had some contractions. If you follow the Boston technical um, news, you, you would have saw uh, about a year and a half ago we had layoffs as well. So with all that in mind, you know, we've had to, the, the engineering teams had to evolve. And so I thought it'd be interesting when Dave asked me to present was, you know, to talk about this evolution and how we've had, how we've like, the, how we thought about DevOps changed over time. So this is, the, you know, our story. Um, it goes in kind of five phases, if you will. Um, and you'll, what, kind of a common thread you'll see is that we're kind of trucking along and things are good. And then all of a sudden we hit a critical inflection point and we've had to change. And so I think those are kind of the interesting points that, um, uh, of our evolution. So let's kind of jump into kind of phase one, right? So this was six years ago, I just joined. I don't think I heard of what DevOps was, you know, truth be known, six years ago. Um, we had two teams, five engineers. Uh, uh, we had a web dashboard team, more of a, um, uh, you know, a mono app and the, our back-end team that does the, the back-end uh, data ingestion. And uh, so kind of how we thought about DevOps back then, it was, you know, we had very little tooling. Um, we deployed off of our laptops. This is something that's common, I guess, at a startup at that size, right? Um, you know, that's that whole analogy of like, uh, in the cloud world, you know, uh, cattle versus pets. Um, and we had a lot of pets. They were all pets. Every every server was named, and if some, one of them went down, it was a it was a big deal. So, but and but because we were five people, we had a pretty big problem in front of us. We had very little overlap between the people, uh, and so, and and because we were five people, we had everyone knew what was going on. So, kind of in this kind of DevOps continuum, like <coughs> there was no automation, but yeah, it kind of worked. So that's kind of where you know where we're at. So uh, these two dots here, kind of, I'll, I'll, it's kind of a theme throughout the, the presentation. You'll see it's like the number of teams that we have at Local Linux. So uh, as we scale up, we'll have more teams. So let's go to phase two. So uh, things are going well, but as you can imagine, we're adding more devs. The web team was actually growing at a faster clip than the backend team, and so they started complaining. Lots of WTFs, like what's going on? And people were stepping over each other's toes. Like I said, we had no automation. Everyone was deploying off of laptops. You can imagine having more than four developers trying to do that on a daily basis is going to be a nightmare. Um, and so at that point, the web team started building their own automation. Um, and the engineers, we didn't actually hire DevOps engineers or ops engineers. We hired uh, the engineers just kind of took it upon themselves at that point to, to build out the tooling. And, um, and so two tools we built out, just, you know, one was called Stager, one was Deployers, but it, ultimately speaking, that they, they just allowed uh, our developers to deploy in a much more predictive way and not to step over each other's toes. The back end team, you know, that second team, had some automation as well. Um, but, you know, what I would kind of describe uh, DevOps in that world, in that phase, is kind of more, we were much more an embedded DevOps team. Um, there were some people that kind of just naturally gravitated to that type of role, and so those engineers ended up doing the work on the team for the team. Um, and and that, that worked for a while, right? And, and, but um, we, we knew that, you know, a little bit of funding came in, uh, we knew we needed to uh, scale up the team more, um, and we, we've seen kind of, and we've heard from other teams that were scaling, um, like, you know, you should really break up your teams. Like, it's like an engineering team after, you know, a team of 10 people probably is not as, as um, functional 
And so we were trying to figure out what, how do we break up the team? Like, and so the questions we had were, like, do we break up teams based on job function? Like, do I keep the back-end engineering team kind of in one area and the front-end engineering team in another area? Or do I break up based on like uh, business goals? So like our push messaging product, like just have full stack everyone there. And then how do I think about DevOps? <coughs> like do I want to, you know, do we want to keep with this embedded model? Or do we want to actually like have a separate DevOps tool doing, you know, the DevOps, right? And so we, we talked to a lot of people, we read a lot about it, and um, two, um, two kind of blog posts or companies kind of stand out. Uh, one is Yammer and the other is Spotify. Spotify's got a really cool 13 minute video about their engineering culture. Um, and we bored heavily on uh, from them. And one of the things that we noticed, um, one thing that was, it was common between the two and the two things we kind of took from them, is one is small teams really work and you know, if you give them a strong mission, they will, you know, they will attack that mission and, uh, successfully. The second thing is that you can start decoupling leadership from management in your organization structure. Um, and so they were pushing, is everyone familiar with the term like matrix organization structure, right? Like, yeah, so, yeah. So it's, um, and so this is kind of the model that they were uh, promoting. Uh, if, if you were an individual contributor, you would have a project lead who is not your HR manager, you'd have a separate person to be your HR manager. Uh, so, you know, as we're scaling up, we're like, okay, like, let's try to experiment with this. And so, uh, what we ended up doing is doing kind of a hybrid of like breaking up the team, you know, a hybrid model. We, we separate, we created one team that kind of splintered off of the web team, and it was aligned around a business goal, but it didn't have the full stack. But they were still able to kind of attack that business goal uh, all together. And Again, we saw some successes there. We saw people very, um, we saw a team that was highly motivated in solving those problems and, uh, you know, think, you know, we were, we were pretty happy with the results. And so at that point we went full matrix, right? We're like, okay, this is the way we're gonna go. We're gonna decouple management and leadership. We've, we ended up forming at, right, we just broke up engineering at, like, um, you know, at, at one day basically. And we've, we formed multiple teams. Um, in the beginning, it was about five teams, uh, and that grew over time. Uh, but it was nice because it, uh, we, it allowed us to give a lot of flexibility to the team size and the mission. Um, the other thing that it gave is gave a, a lot of opportunity for people to take on leadership roles. So you didn't have to necessarily be a manager to be a leader and have a larger impact. So that was. That was kind of cool. So there was a lot of successes there. So again, things were going really well. Um, at this point, we also had to figure out, okay, well, what are we gonna do about the, the you know, how do we wanna think about DevOps and the DevOps practices? And so in this world, we ended up, because we're building out five teams at one time, and they all had very similar needs, we decided that instead of like having an embedded model like we've had so far, we'd actually build out a tools team. And the tools team was, uh, was mission was to actually enable, kind of borrowing from what Chuck was saying, enabling the other teams out there. Um, the, the, parts of, like, the parts of like DevOps and where you're like much more SRE and you're kind of managing production systems, that function was still kept on the engineering teams uh, by the engineers, but it's the tooling that, you know, how to get code to Amazon was, uh, was kind of pushed out to a separate team. So, kind of going back to this DevOps continuum, if you will, uh, the tools team was formed, um, and we had about five teams uh, at Lookalytics. So, things were, actually really improving. We saw a lot of um, uh, progress here. And as you could, you know, we were tripling in revenue, we tripled in team size, and things were, were pretty good. Um, but as all things, you know, they, some, sometimes it doesn't get, you know, eventually it became not so great, and we were, we were hitting against some, some challenges. 
And what we found is that the team was busy, but they weren't making the impact that we wanted them to make. Um, and as a manager, we had, as a management team, we ended up having a bunch of series of retrospectives. We're really big on retrospectives. We'll have a retrospective about anything. Um, and, uh, and so we, like, this was really important. We were, like, trying to figure out, well, what, what are we, like, you know, what is, uh, what is happening here? And we kind of found that we kind of, when we stepped back and we uh, kind of evaluated what we're doing, we kind of took a really good thing. Have you ever done this? Like, taking a really good thing and taking it to an extreme and made it really bad, right? Um, so, and I think that's what ended up happening here. So, uh, we wanted to be super agile and like really like um, move and and change based on you know new business needs and new competition and things like that. So, every two weeks we're getting into a room with all the leads <coughs> and we're updating the teams. Uh, and we're like moving people from place to, and we thought this was like a great thing and we'd also and sometimes we'd actually form teams of one person or and like so you can imagine or it's at times we had scale up to 15 people so it there was a you know in hindsight you know obviously I knew that was a you know now I know it was a bad thing but at the time it felt like we were doing the right thing because we're um, we were trying to just you know, bend to the to the business needs. So as a result, like if you're moving around, some of uh, you you kind of you're preventing developers de from gelling with our other team members. And you know, like everyone knows here, like it takes a while for teams to gel and to to connect. Um, and so, and we also found that it it it, it basically they weren't developing the expertise that we wanted them to. In addition to that, because the teams were so narrowly defined, that there ended up being a lot of cross-team dependencies, and so um, it was it was kind of interesting because because you had such a narrow mission, if you ha if you were blocked on another team, like you would basically stop, and and that you know that was probably one one of the strongest reasons why we're gumming up the pipeline. Um, it also, because we were narrowly defining all the teams, it required a lot of centralized planning. And so there was a few of us that would try to figure out things, uh, kind of sprints ahead of each other, uh, a sprint ahead. And so as a result, a lot of the stuff that we, that we you would expect a lead to kind of figure out, we were figuring out in advance. And so that wasn't motivating. And we knew, you know, with these retrospectives, we knew we were making some mistakes. And then this, and the last kind of like challenge we had during this phase was that the, the this tools team ended up being a bottleneck. And the reason they became a bottleneck is because they were the front for Amazon. And that was never the intention, but it just like slowly over time morphed into that. Um, and and that was and so anytime you needed anything done in production, you would have to create a ticket, and it would sit there for a couple of uh, a couple of days, and that was a challenge. And again. This would gum up the pipeline, uh, the delivery pipeline. So that was that's kind of you know at the end of phase four, um, I would say you know the best way to describe our DevOps state then is that the the tools team was at bottleneck. And you can see like we we spread like the number of teams here. I think uh, we we went up to uh, twelve uh, from five. So. Um, at, at the end of the phase, we kind of we did those retrospectives. We've kind of figured out, okay, this is where we want to go to, and and one of the, one of the things that we wanted to do is we we kind of decided is we, we wanted to build teams that were long-lived, independent two pizza teams. Now that's a huge, that's a, that's a big mouthful, but that's what we wanted to do. Um, and so let me kind of uh, talk about what that actually means. Um, we wanted the teams to be independent. So kind of mentioning, hey, like we don't we don't want teams to uh, be dependent on other teams, and so that was really important for us. Another guiding principle that was important for us: we wanted large, fewer, larger teams. Um, and so if there was changing changes in businesses, these teams can kind of handle it and absorb those changes within their teams themselves. Um, and they, you, and if like if you need some, you know, you wouldn't have to 
like we we really try to avoid putting tickets on somebody else's backlog. Um, and the, and the kind of the last thing is that we wanted the teams to be long lived, and we wanted to anchor changes instead of like every sprint. We were uh, I want to we wanted to anchor these cha team changes around a quarter, and we had a bias towards moving missions instead of moving team members. So. That was kind of the guiding principles that we wanted to kind of uh, push forward. And for the DevOps team, in this, we wanted to um, really change their, go back to what we really wanted, like a focus between uh, being gatekeepers of like Amazon and our production environments to enablers. Um, and so we ended up, as a result, when pushing up like moving a lot of members to the DevOps team to start building out enablement tools. I think it'd, like, it'd be kind of really interesting for a DevOps meeting to talk about a lot of these. We built a bunch of them, and I'm sure other people have similar tools where you can enable engineering teams to be more successful. And one example I have a screenshot here is a, a Slack bot where it's kind of a two key system. Um, where if you want to get elevated permissions for an hour to production, uh, you just kind of do a slash DEF CON request and um, so, uh, another member can actually approve it. The key here is it's not a, it, it could be any engineer on the engineering team. It doesn't have to be a DevOps person. Uh, again, really pushing the idea of enablement versus gatekeeping. So, you know, in this, in kind of the continuum, we went back down to five teams. Uh, there are five teams that are larger um, and from a DevOps point of view, the internal team, uh, internal t tools team is focusing on enabling versus being gatekeepers. So just kind of wrapping it up, you know, it's still an evolution, we're gonna change. Uh, I can already see where, where some of the changes need to happen, where some of the changes need to happen in the future as we grow. Um, but I will say anecdotally, the, for the last year or so, the team is, uh, working at a higher velocity and we're able to ship a lot faster and more effectively than we were <coughs> two years ago. So that's, that's really inspiring. Uh, and I feel like the team is really is happier and has a better sense of ownership over their work. So thank you. Awesome, so thanks again, Mohit. We're gonna take a five minute break, let everybody get more drinks, stretch and stuff, and then come back. I was an engineer, and yeah, an engineer. We, we don't actually. We, yeah, yeah. 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 So we were very, we never, we weren't self, uh, oh, we, we were very specific on who was all the so we never, we, yeah, we didn't actually have like self, like, kind of like, what's that term, um, uh, the Zappos model, um, it's escaping me, but where they kind of like do their own things, we, we were, we were actually, we're like, this is the team that's going to solve this problem, and you know, we're going to give them a healthy amount of people, I did both. I built so I'm a manager there, uh, and I built out the DevOps team. I built out like our back end infrastructure, like the thing that does like ingest like our billion data points. I helped build that out. Um, I haven't coded in a, in a year or two, so now I don't do any of that stuff. Um, <laughs> I do, I do, I do. I do well, it's not fair. I do some coding at home, uh, but they're mostly in the world of lambdas whenever I get a chance. Oh, oh you do data. Yeah. Yeah. Well, even our DevOps team, like the DEF CON, um, um, 
like app or GP system. That that was all uh, Lambdas and like using a little bit of Dynamo and stuff. Cool. Yeah, yeah. So it was, it was pretty cool. It was, it was a fun project to work with. I started in like QA automation. Okay. And I kind of went to DevOps. We could never get our systems up. Right. So wait, you know, way back, it's like, I need to test this. So we just made up DevOps. Like, all right, so what? Well, DevOps. So I need to push. Linux servers, create them on the fly. Yeah. We have containers back then. Yeah. Like, but now yeah. it's like this big thing. It's like, I've been doing that for a while now. It's yeah. always a network. Like, yeah, yeah, you're right. We get distributed systems. It's always a network. <laughs> Anyways, nice to meet you. Thank you. Uh, and I enjoyed the speech. Yeah. Excited. Hi. 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 So I didn't talk about that, um, but we actually don't have that. That's the other thing I wanted to do. Yeah. So the developers themselves are responsible for their quality. Yeah. So we, it's a good question. So we've had some challenges here and there. Um, so what we'll end up doing, and we've had, We've thought a lot about this. We've had, we've actually, we're going to build out a whole QA function and had three different challenges. Um, what we've done is basically, I make sure as a manager, I give a lot of time on the backside for automated engineers. Unit tests and integration tests, and we have a whole system for them. We have uh, systems where, um, so we're running at a pretty high scale that, like, when you're pushing out stuff, like, we have really, um, very complicated metrics dashboards, and so when we push our code, we're able to see how things go up and down. And if there's some challenges, we do quick rollback so we'll for the logs forward and stuff. So, so, so you're, you're really taking your yeah. as you do. Yeah. So you're getting the results of your automated testing and yeah. showing that. Exactly, and then and then when you're deploying, we kind of measure how uh, well uh, the deployment's going, and then we'll roll. And so we'll do things like we'll roll out a canary, so we can do that. Yeah, so we'll roll out a canary, um, and then we'll uh, and if that canary is really bad, we roll it back pretty quickly, um, and so. The, the system is complicated enough right now, like, like especially when you start thinking about like, there's 50 different services, it's going to be really hard to have a dedicated QA team to kind of figure all that stuff. There's some... Okay. actually studying the rollout. Yeah. Okay. yeah, it's changing. It's absolutely changing. Yeah, yeah. And so... I, I think it's interesting. Um, like, if we were at uh, a healthcare app, I think I may not be as likely to do it the way we are, but we're. But, well, compliance, I'm okay dealing. Well, if there's money involved or someone's people's lives involved, I probably would not advocate for a kind of approach. We're, we're, we have a tolerance for dropping a little data. It's like a point zero zero one percent of our data drops. Not a big deal, right? Because we're processing two or three billion data points a day, so um, doesn't really matter. Consistency Yes, exactly. Yeah, they, they, a lot of that. So it, we're for, for me, I'm. Um, so that's why we've kind of opted the way. That being said. We've had some challenges. Uh, we send out messages to, um, we send push messages to mobile devices. The last thing you want is 50 messages coming up, and you know, the same identical messages. And you'll have an angry customer, right? It's a very. Um, so we put in some checks and balances there, and that's been pretty good. Uh, but it's still an evolution. If we scale up quite a bit, I can see us adding the QA, but we haven't done that yet. But you have done the QA function. You've, yeah. You've definitely implemented the unit test integration test, yes. system level test security function. Yes. Etc. All so you really We've done it but yeah, but, but it's the engineer. You've done it with a separate team, which yes. is five yeah. so it's a function that's important. Well, the, the only challenge that I had, like a good quality assurance person will think about the problem in a slightly different way uh, versus an engineer, and I've seen that. Um, and, yes, 
where you it guys developed you guys located and you was like Pardon me? The uh, the developers generally have the same amount of time that has right. the scaling issues that are performance issues. Right. Yeah. But also yeah. where you guys located. Right across from Government Center. That's a good location. And when you said you looked at what type of people you looked for? Uh, just engineers. So uh, we're looking for like so we're actually starting to go down the route of like ISO and SOC two compliance. So we're we're starting to. We've, 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 we've got a great batch of some really good people. Okay. Was a good time. Um, how do you spell your last name? Uh, the O R D I L <coughs> D I L. You can look me up on the the demo. Oh, you're right on the demo. Perfect. Yeah. 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 We've got we've got a really good. Um, we've got a really good. Okay. Yeah, because you guys are scaling up. You're right on target and the kind of stuff that we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, this is where everything is going. Yeah. Companies that don't get this and really, they're going to be lost behind. It's very complicated. It's very complicated. Yeah, but a lot of companies are getting how to do this. We're, we're seeing it. Yeah. So, yeah, we're, we're, you guys are thinking. Yeah, it's just everything's moving so quickly right now. Yeah. When I mean, you're in technology, like you're in the type of accounts you're dealing with, you need to be able to be very, it's like an athlete, it's like the Patriots. You know, they need a position. You know, they, you've got to be always moving forward or someone will pass you. Yeah. Exactly. Well, good to meet you. Good to meet you, too. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. Study have done to DevOps. In our career recently, two, okay. two clouds, right? And it's two very, two very different problems, but similar in a couple of ways. The biggest problem being the transformation Hello? to the DevOps. All right, we're going to be wrapping it back up. Bring it in, bring it in. That on top of just even getting an agile. All right, you guys want to. Let's see if I can answer my question on it. Sure, sure. Uh, uh, let me answer it for a second. So, you talked about um, the tools team being a bottleneck uh, entirely. But my question is, was the tools team simply just responsible for um, identifying and appropriating the tools that would re relieve bottlenecks for the teams? Or was it literally, okay, we've given you the cloud, oh wait, we didn't give them. There was not a proper handoff, therefore were the cloud people. They were, yeah, so all of the above. Like they were, they were in charge of uh, being the cloud experts, right? Uh, Amazon experts. They were in charge of uh, getting, eliciting requirements, basically being a product manager uh, and trying to figure out like what are all the pain points are. Then they were also in charge of like security, right? And then they were in charge of um, and making sure that no one screws up. Was this a state school? No, no, no. This was at local. This was at local. Linux? Yeah, yeah. Like a lot of your they get to not not on your part, but literally on just like the not the requirement gathering, but like the 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 whole. I'm, I'm thinking things like vendor lists at this point. No, no, that's not that's not what we're talking about. Okay. So when I'm talking about like, and I, like I'm Paul by the way. Hi, Mohit. Um, we're so they were in charge of building out a series of tools that would, their original goal was to enable other engineers, so, but like, who's performance at some point come into the play? Like, well, we've already solved that problem with this tool, go use this tool instead. So this is, this was before, like, Docker was really that big, or like, you know, like, um, any of the contain container systems, and so, we weren't, like, we were still, and we still are on, Straight up VMs, and we're not reading a manual. Um, to um, Terraform, oh, okay. <laughs> sorry, um, <laughs> Kubernetes or or anything like that. So, um, I mean, so the reason I ask is because I work with a lot of Fortune, and they, in some cases, for those first teams, and I also agree that in other cases that's a bottleneck. But the question is. You've arrived at being a bottleneck because of what? And to, to uh, Chuck's point, have you not taken the leap to go from a, a champion to a, what was the middle column to an enabler? Right? And that's the point is when you actually scale this out. Hey guys, we're going to start. Cool teams. 
Mm -hmm. I will be louder. I, I think we're there now. Oh, we're right. there now. Yeah. It took us a couple of years. I meant that in a good way. Oh, woo! So that's, that was the problem. Is that yeah. we, we didn't have enough capacity, like, enough people. Come on, you guys can have the beers later too. Uh, to build up the tools that we need. You can even bring them with like, you. Even like, like how to get to like, get another one. Yeah. But, <laughs> For the prompt, folks, you can uh, read the cartoon. Others Only might miss it. Dog voice. Please don't get me started. I'm a little bit obsessed about dogs. I've had projects to be called dogs. Yeah, just... Sorry. Sorry. You guys need that thing? The recording thing? No? Yeah, I should go on. How important is Okay, I'll start. Whoever missed the cool stuff, I guess missed the cool stuff. The cool presentation is after mine, by the way, just so everybody knows. Because that's when you actually learn how to actually do DevOps. Um, but at least we'll share all of our secrets. We just run a board. Patrick will share the secrets. Um, all right, so a little bit about Chewy. Uh, for those that may not know this, uh, we're an online pet retailer, right? We sell a bunch of pet products. We started by a couple of guys in 2011. We're now a 5,000 people company. Woo. Six years, okay? Uh, what do we do? We do a lot of things really well. Um, we have the best in class customer service, and we deliver stuff really, 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 really fast. In any case, it's faster than Amazon. What I mean by really good customer service, you call an 800 number, somebody answers the phone in the next few seconds. They're all based in the US. They're all trained for weeks. They know everything about the company, our products, everything. And they have full authority and autonomy to tell you, basically, answer all your questions. We don't track time, how long they're on the phone with you. They just service whatever you need. You need, you know, you're saying, okay, you know, I just ordered dog food, talk about dog food, and, you know, my dog didn't like it. Can I return it? We'll basically say, no, you cannot. But here's a list of local shelters. Please donate the bag. We'll obviously take it off of your uh, you know, bill and off you go. Which brings us to the next thing is we donate a lot, right? A lot of times to our customers, which is like the example I just gave. Uh, that's just one example. I can talk about our customer service forever. Uh, for anybody who knows what an NPR score is, net promoter score, uh, I think like Amazon is in the 70s. Um, Starbucks is in the 70s, companies you know, ours is 91. That's when a third party goes and asks customers of like, what do they think about the service of the company, okay? I live right downtown, I order dog food. I specifically order from Chewy and Amazon at the same time. Chewy delivers faster more than 50% of the time. Uh, and yes, we can deliver everywhere in the United States. Um, and, you know, the bottom piece there is we're growing fast, we're now huge, and we're actually accelerating growth, okay, as a business. So that's Chewy, so let's talk about a little bit of the growth so you guys can like, understand what we're dealing with here. So again, software team, right? Two years ago, there were three people on the team, okay? So everything was built, there were just a few people. 50 software engineers today, about 120 total in IT. Uh, we, by end of next year, should be over 200 people in software. So we're gonna hire about 50 people in software in the next 12 months, another 100 the year after. Uh, we're gonna run out of this space by next July, and we're gonna either get another floor here or move to another building. Like, we're already all that. Um, in three years, I don't know, some people ask me, like, what are you gonna do in three years? Ask me then, I don't know if it's a three-digit or four-digit number of how big our software team will be. Literally, ask me in a year, I'll tell you. So now to DevOps. I'll take questions then. Now to DevOps. Um, so, you know, we've heard a lot of really good speeches. By the way, 
Pivotal, a really cool company, Local Analytics as well. I've worked with both of them before, awesome companies. Um, so a lot of their path on DevOps and like different challenges that people have had, like those are real things. We all face them, every company in every stage. Um, so, so it's kind of cool that everybody got came down to talk at the same time here. Um, so everybody asks, what is DevOps? Why the hell does everybody ask that? Well, simply because not everybody really knows, and at different times there might be a different answer, right? So mar is it a marketing or recruiting term? Well, it is. Once people found out, oh my god, if you're a DevOps engineer, like these people are looking for DevOps. <laughs> but none of the people in that conversation have any idea what they're talking about. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, so is DevOps a job title, right? Is it a way of working, is it a way of thinking? It's yes to all of those. But the challenge is like when you're talking without context, it's completely meaningless, right? And we're like finding that's why everybody asks the questions all the time, right? Nobody really like you have to think about it, study it, learn it, figure it out, live it, then then you get it. Um, like there's no deck or presentation you can go to really get it. Like it, it's it's a like it's a learning. Um, and by the way, some of my slides are busy. And I'm gonna try not to read them, but yeah, you know, I'll do my best here. So uh, yeah, there's a lot of like pets with computers and stuff. <laughs> um, so this is like, what do I think is a successful engineering organization um, and DevOps, right? So this is what we all know. We all agree on that, right? I'm gonna read it verbatim. Not read the slides ever again, but I'll read this verbatim. Key to success, enabling effective communication, collaboration between engineers, managers, product owners, customers, teams, blah, blah, blah. We all agree, right? Great. How the hell do you do that? <laughs> um, so, um, so let me step back. So DevOps, we have development, we have operations. What does development want to do? Release software faster. What does operations want to do? Keep everything stable. Yeah. What's the easiest way to destabilize production? Release software. <laughs> Actual friction. And then all these say, hey, you want to work in DevOps? Like, go work with them. It's like the, the, the crazy friction place. Um, so, how do you actually do that when everybody wants to fight each other, right? So this is kind of complicated. So, first, you have to actually learn and train and understand. Everybody has to actually learn what they're doing, right? Which means new people come in, have to learn about your business, have to learn about how you work. Whichever stage of evolution in the organization you are, you have to learn how you work. So then they can bring that experience and actually help you. So if you're hiring people, you have to train them. Not to train them how to do work, you're hiring them because they already know something. Train them about your company so they understand how you work, right? So train and boarding, probably like the most important first thing. Because if you don't do that, everything else is irrelevant. Next, self-organization. Everybody says this, it's all this great stuff. Like everybody has a different department. What do you mean self-organization? If you're in that department, you organize there. If you're in that department, you organize there. Like what the hell does that mean? Well, the whole point is, you want to put people together to solve problems, like whether the project teams, or the scrum teams, or the backlog, whatever it is, you have to put the right people that you need to solve that problem for a duration of time together to solve the problem. And enable them, like back to this word, which means you give them everything they need to actually solve it. No dependencies on anybody else, no, nothing else. So what does that mean? You put a bunch of engineers, of all types on a team and they solve the problems. And they build stuff and they build stuff and they build stuff. And the moment they run into an obstacle where they need something from another team, raise your hand and say why, change it so in the future they don't need it, and move forward, right? So we're gonna talk a little bit more about this. Um, next thing, so the, the self-organization, by the way, once you enable the teams to kind of like solve their own problems, they'll figure out who they need, go to those departments, and pull those people into their team. Whether it's for 10 minutes, for an hour, or raise their hands like, hey, we need that person here, because now they see that this is how people are organized, so they're gonna try to organize that way, right? Um, constant change. So this is a natural problem to all of us, right? Requirements change, technologies change, change to tools, deadlines, blah, blah, blah. So, and this, this changes at different rates for everybody, but everything's always changing, just the world we live in. Partially why we all have jobs, because it all changes and they all need us, right? It's great. Um, 
<laughs> the constant change makes it really, really hard if you decide that you organize in a way that works. The moment you organize it, we're organizing this way and it works, you just got it wrong. Which means that whatever you do, whatever management does, you have to have the air cover to continue evolving the organization. Okay? Very, very important. Um, and embracing agile. So, um, what is agile? Agile is a methodical way of dealing with change. That's all it is. So people say, what kind of agile do you do? You have Scrum, Kanban, do you have two weeks sprints? Like all those things, like, I mean, they kind of matter the mechanics, but that's not the point. The point is, if something changes, you have them, like, people know what to do. This changed, great, go to the next sprint planning meeting. This changed, it's interrupting this sprint. I need to tell somebody something else is falling in, like, whatever, it's a methodical way of dealing with it. So the most important part is to create the mechanics so you can deal with change, okay? So embracing Agile actually helps people deal with that change in an organized way versus like, oh, ask my manager, right? The moment that happens, like, you did not enable the team. Make sense? Okay. So, oh, I've got a lot of people say, like, okay, how do you build a DevOps org? Like, how do you hire? Like, what, what skill set do you hire for? Uh, so, so this is my top secret list, right? First, you have to have an environment where people come to work because of the people there. This is the thing. So let's say we want development, operations, all the different groups to talk to each other. Let's build teams in this way. Let's give them these two. If they don't want to talk to each other, if they don't like each other, you can organize people until you blue in the face. It's going to be irrelevant, right? That's why you have to hire for the similar culture. People actually want to talk to each other. So if you need somebody, you're not sure like, if you like the person, but they have all the skill set, wrong person. Right? Next, you want to be in the room with people smarter than you. So that's important. If you hire people that are going to help you do something, wouldn't you want them to know something more than you do? Like, that's the whole point. So if you hire people that are not saying I'm the smartest one in this field, but I know this thing I can help you with, and the next person can help you with something else, next person can help you with something else, you're constantly building that environment where people are trying to learn from each other, right? And trying to hire people smarter and better. Why is that also important, especially when you're growing, companies are growing? Because at higher scale, you need people that have seen that scale before. And everybody else would love that because they can learn from somebody. Right? So like, don't forget, like, as it changes and the organization grows, that matters. Next, obsessed about customer's happiness. So that's another thing. Um, the religious wars about which tools to use, or some people I've worked with here in the past from my last three companies, well, to all of you. Um, I'll pick one, you'll know who you are. Should we use Puppet or Ansible? Let's debate it for the next two years. Really? <laughs> what happens in the meantime, the customer gets everything like, who cares when, like, we need to win our debate. Like, really? So the whole important thing, like, what does it matter for the customer? Like, we need to make a faster decision, move forward, so we can actually deliver stuff faster, better, so the customer's happier, right? The moment you lose sight of that, it's irrelevant. So that's, an, and by the way, you can like, these things are things you can interview for, right? For example, um, I ask technical questions a lot of times in an interview, which literally just like, I don't want a technical answer, I want somebody to actually tell me something that has to do with the customer. If they do, uh -huh, they're thinking outside of the box. They actually think about the customer, not the technology. You can develop questions like that. Um, be valuable to the business. So a lot of people like to sit in the corner, build some stuff, and they're just happy they're working on things, right? Great for many environments, right? In a world where you want to make sure people are talking to each other, they're helping each other be successful, they need to want to be valuable to the business. So like whatever, like for example, if I'm building something and say I am a DevOps engineer and I'm building a tool for this team that needs to do this, I want to be valuable to them and understand how that value brings value to the business, right? Again, something you can interview for, right? As you ask your questions, you see if the person cares about the business. If they don't, they're not trying to be valuable to the business, they're just doing whatever they're doing, which might be okay. Um, and the last one, some people debate sometimes, is crush competition. And by the way, all of these exist at Chewy, 
And it's an important thing to hire for, but like cross competition, most important thing ever. If you look at the best companies out there, like, you know, all the major companies you know that are doing a good job, right, they all crush their competition. Why? And they all organize in a different way to solve the same DevOps problems. Like, like, you know, Facebook, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, they're all organized differently. But they all crush competition, and they all figure out how to organize in a one scale, right? The reason that's important is it forces you not to like stagnate in how you're organized, right? Again, if you need to move forward and you're not actually thinking about competition, like you're basically done that moment. If you really want to win in the business world, if you don't, guess what? DevOps, right? Like it doesn't matter. Does that make sense? Okay. This is a really busy slide. I'm trying to say four things. So, how is Chewy Engineering organized, right? This is gonna sound a lot like DevOps, but just like, you know, give you some insight. So, ramp up, learn, communicate. So, hire better people all the time, right? We already talked about that, but I have an underlying thing here is, if you are hiring the right people, they will tell you how to build it, okay? If you're hiring people so you can tell them how to build it, like, first, your organization is upside down. The person that's outside the building should, like, go and build it. Or hire the person outside the building. But, like, it's not going to work otherwise. Then, um, and by the way, ramping up, that's another thing is, in a organization that really works in DevOps way, ramping up is actually easier. So we all have the excuse, we don't have enough ramp up data, we don't have enough, like, videos, we don't have, like, it's hard to ramp up. This is what people find a way to ramp up. So if you can't find a way to ramp up, and you think you're organizing in DevOps way, probably you're not, because people are obviously not talking to each other, right? So it's like, first sign. Next, autonomous teams. Each team has to have everything they need to develop. So we have, right now, 10 scrum teams. Each one has a backlog, they have a technical product manager, and they go. So for example, they all work out of their own repos most of the time, or we're splitting repos as we go. But the point is, you have a team of engineers, you've defined that this is a service, this is something you're building. You peel them off, you peel the repo off, you build tools and release engineering and operational tools you need, and then off they go on their backlog with automation testing and everything else. But the point is, the moment you find that they need something from somebody else, build an API, move forward, or find some other way to separate. If they need somebody else because, okay, they are you know, constantly stuck in QA, great. Hire some QA people, give it to them. Right? Whatever it is, that team has to be self-organized. Yes, smaller teams are better, but the most important thing is to make sure the team has everything they need. Like some people get, oh, we can't have more than four people on a team or five people. Who cares? Make sure the team has everything they need. Some people are doing machine learning, some people are doing Python, so like people are doing different things. Some cases you might need seven people, some cases you might need two, like who cares? The point is they need to be autonomous. Okay, um, so some people also ask, you know, define, develop, test, deploy, let was going to read further down here. Some people say, can this work with compliance? Like SOX compliance, we say, well, SOX mostly, we say compliance is not that hard. Because SOX basically says, you know, you have to have separation of duties. Oh my God, everybody on this team has everybody they need, so, oh my God. Well, actually, like, it's one person that can't write code, commit, merge, deploy, and operate. SAS doesn't want you to stop from functional development, right? SAS is basically saying, I said I want one person to be able to go beginning to end. So if you actually have a team of people, well, let's say you're organizing a department, let's say you're a large financial organization, and you're organizing 20 different departments, right? You have this department that can do this, this one, this, this, like, et cetera, right? So get everybody together and, like, go through the whole process. It's the same thing. Right? So you can totally have everybody meet on one team and develop and be SAS compliant and be very, very happy as long as different teams have different jobs and different roles. Right? And you have certain oversight for certain types of actions, etc. Um, in fact, it's easier to get SAS compliant because you've defined who has access to what on that team. Like, it's very, like, people know who to go to for what. They're like, right there, they all know each other. It's not like some ticket to some department that they've never heard of before. CI, CD as soon as possible. So how do you get to DevOps? Automate, right? Um, automate testing, deployment operations, measurement and monitoring, everything has to be automated. And by the way, every single thing you build will be in different levels of maturity. Some stuff, 
like some team might already have everything on it and some teams are just starting and they might not and other teams might be like halfway and you have organizations that are different but whatever it is as long as you're trying to get there and you're always like moving forward you have a shot you will never have everything automated flawlessly because that means you're not building new things so everybody says like there's this utopia we're going to like we're going to get like it's not going to happen it's not i can tell you that right now nobody's fully automated so, but when you start a new project, so like the larger companies, right, what they do is they put everybody, the larger companies know how to DevOps well, they put everything they need on the team, and the first few months, all that team does is tooling for what they're building. When they're done with that, then they actually start doing whatever functionality is needed. And then there's the rest of us, right, that try to like model along a lot of the way. So like if you really want to get to DevOps, you have to make a decision that tooling comes first before you do anything else. Okay, and CI/CD is a goal that if you can achieve it, you will like. You basically can't achieve it unless you work in the DevOps world. Like it's physically not possible. Uh, which brings us to the next entertaining question: Is release engineering is that in development or operations? Yes. <laughs> what is that? Yeah. Yes, this is interesting. Yeah. So the answer is yes. But it varies depending on the company you are and where you are and the maturity of your release engineering process. And that might even vary based on the system you're building. You might have five different systems you're building, right? And this is, this is how it works, right? So let's say we have a startup, three, four people. The software team is developing the code and releasing it. Great. Then we get a little bit bigger, and we're like, okay, we need to get to CICD, let's automate this. And at this point, we hired some operation people because like, now we need rest customers now, we need to be stable, right? We move forward. And then at some point, that release engineering practice automates that release engineering part, right? That actually gets you to continuous deployment. Once you have that, it becomes interesting, right? Because anytime you have a bug and you want to release it, you need that system. If that system is down, you can't fix the production issue. So what does that mean? The release engineering system itself is operational. It's your production system. The moment that becomes production, release engineering becomes an operational team. Period. It has to be stable. It can't not be. So the answer of yes is like, sometimes it's in software, sometimes it's operational. It's that transition. Like you're actually trying to get it to operational. Does that make sense? Um, and the, uh, that's actually what we're doing. We're now developing a release engineering practice. So we have 10 scrum teams. So we're going to have about 20 scrum teams in 12 months as we double the engineering team. We'll have about 45 to 50 three years from now. Um, at that point, we're about four. Well, I told you test in a year, so I'll tell you that. Um, but the point is, we're doing this now so we can get more teams to that maturity, more pieces of the pool. Of the system, so we can actually make sure that it's an operational system. Like, it's a good thing if it's an operational system. Make sense? Cool. All right, we keep going. Uh, so, career path, I really like that. There was a discussion about career paths earlier. So, another thing that, and this is actually critical in DevOps development, <coughs> best technologists build the best technology, right? Amazing technology. That's kind of the thing. So, I have some stuff under here, I'll read it really quickly. Don't put your engineers in meetings. Don't tell them to manage people. Don't ask them to make decisions without, without having their hands and basically, it's like, hey, you're an amazing engineer. You should start managing, right? You've heard that before. <laughs> and then like three months later, it's like, can you make this technical decision? It's just like, wait, like I have, like, can I ask the engineers now? So like at some point, like the whole point is, you actually want engineers to make decisions. So the best engineers should stay engineers. That's what they like to do anyway. Um, technical teams, they will always make the best decisions. You can have the best managers out there. It doesn't matter. Technical teams make the best decisions, right? So uh, you don't want them to make their decisions in a vacuum, right? You don't want to make them make those decisions without experienced people. And by the way, this gets interesting, right? If your career path is you have to become a manager, that means no, nobody on your team has enough experience to make good decisions at scale. Period. Right. So what happens? If you're organized that way, you can DevOps plan all the previous slides all you want. Like, it's not going to happen. Right? You have to have a technology path all the way up the organization. 
Otherwise, you can never really create the ability to have seniority and oversight, architecture oversight, and stuff like that, right? Because all those folks are managing people, right? And if you're growing fast like Chewy is, if you ask your best engineers to manage a lot of people, we're going to double the size of the engineering team every year for the next two, three years. I want my best engineers to engineer, and I want to hire the best managers to manage. Like, that's kind of the idea. The moment you take your best engineers, you ask them to manage, like, you failed. Um, so, this kind of continues. I think I kind of said all this already. Um, but at Chewy, there's a technical path all the way up the organization, right? That's basically it. Um, there's nothing more to say. Now, on that note, so that's how I think engineer organization needs to evolve and get created, right? And that's how DevOps actually can get there. And people, like, every year we're in all different companies, we all have different levels of maturity, what it is, some are thinking about it, some like fighting certain issues, whatever it is. But there are certain parts in this where how you hire, how you run people up, how you organize, how you evolve people, probably 90% of the work. If you hire people who can't talk to each other, remember, like, it's not gonna happen. So, what we have next, which is kind of really cool, is Patrick is gonna actually tell you how to actually do DevOps. Like, all of our trade secrets that nobody knows. Um, and I'm happy to take questions later. Why do you hate cats? Cat was on there, it was the first slide, or second slide. Not enough cats. <laughs> I will fix it by next time, I promise. We have a 50-50 we division here, and a lot of cats, dogs. Just so you know, we here. sell products for horses, for small animals, for like literally, like I don't actually discriminate. <laughs> um, Goldfish? Anything. Yep. All right, so my name is Patrick. I am the DevOps lead for Chewy. Um, basically, I'm going to be talking about kind of how uh, we do DevOps at Chewy. So this is gonna be more of a presentation of our beliefs, our policy, our procedure, not really in the, uh, the technical side of the products we use or anything like that, though there is some overlap. So what does DevOps mean to Chewy? Um, you might think of DevOps as kind of a two different roles on the same team, development and operations, people who do a little bit of both. To us at Chewy, DevOps is the development of operations, taking your operational tasks and making them automated, making them uh, controlled by tools and stuff and building the tools that do that. So how do we do that? Um, first is yes, automation. Probably it's one of the foremost things in DevOps is automate everything. We do that, we automate every little thing that comes along or we try to anyways. So a lot of what DevOps does um, is we get the requests from other teams within the company. So um, your software engineers, they want you to release their software to the public. Your product managers want to be able to see statistics on the product that's being released. So we build the tools that let the other teams do that. Um, but the goal is to build these tools for the other teams. So don't build a DevOps tool that the DevOps team uses and let the other team kind of just give them permissions to access it. No, you need to build these tools with the other teams in mind. Ask them for their input, how they want to use it. Um, that way you're not throwing this tool over to them and they're like, what is this? I have no idea what this tool is or how to use it. It's, it's Greek. So build the tool for them and then train them how to use it so that um, when they do need to use it, they're not having to come to you and ask you how every single time that they need to use it. Um, for us, about 90% of our time is development. Um, probably about 15% of the time is troubleshooting and about 5% is uh, uh, operational tasks. And yes, those numbers do not equal 100%. There is quite a bit of overlap between debugging and development. Um, you uh, develop something, you push it out to production, it breaks, you debug it, it's an end of cycle. Um, deploy during the day. I'm not saying you should deploy during the day, but you should be comfortable deploying the day. Um, the quality of your code should be such that you can deploy at noon without fear of breaking down your system. It may not be your normal practice, you might deploy at 2 a.m., but you should be comfortable doing it. Your code should be mature. 
Now, that is a lot of work. To build for automating everything is a royal pain in your hand. It is going to cause you those nightmares. There are a lot of things you can do to help this out. Um, first, the requests that you're getting from other teams, the other teams generally are going to be requesting the wrong thing. They don't understand how this system works. They come along and request X. Um, it turns out that X might not be the right way to solve the problem that they're trying to address. So you need to dig into them or dig into the product problem with them, try and figure out what it is they're actually trying to accomplish, and then implement that. Um, this kind of goes to my second point there. Um, do it right the first time. If you're implementing X because that's what they requested, and then two weeks later it finds out, oh, hey, what you or what you implemented doesn't actually work, or it's too limited, you have to throw it away and completely start over from scratch because you didn't do the due, dil due diligence of investigating it. Um, you're just wasting time. So design it right. Doesn't mean you have to design it or implement it all in the first round, but make it extensible so that you can grow it as time goes on. Um, and then three, use existing tools. Um, I'm sure you've probably heard of NIH syndrome, not invented deer syndrome. Um, the more tools that you build internally, the more time that you're going to have to spend working on those tools. And when it breaks, if it's a tool that you've built yourself, you don't have a third party that you can go to for support on the tool. You have to do it yourself, but just waste your time. So use existing tools as much as possible. Um, I even go so far as to say use open source tools. Um, there's a really, really good reason for that. Open source tools, you can extend, you can modify them. Um, the, one of the good things about this is that if you find a tool that suits your need but, but it isn't complete, you can make it uh, complete, do it what you need to do, is you can write the code to get to do what you need to do and then give that code upstream to the maintainer and then absolve yourself of responsibility for it. So you get to write the tool that does what you need and then it's no longer your problem. Somebody else maintains it. So um, it allows you to basically get what you need done and then move on to newer and better things. So uh, another aspect is sensible alerting. Um, I've worked in other places and I've seen a lot of places where your alerting system just generates a ton of noise, and you have to basically treat, uh, treat alerts to come in. Oh, hey, that alert, it doesn't actually mean anything. Just ignore it, we see it all the time. Don't do that. All your alerts should be actionable. Um, your alert either needs to be fixed what is being alerted on, or fix the alert itself. Basically, every single alert that comes in should be able to have a action. Um, also, I've seen an auto alert a lot of other places that have like a knock or a help desk or something whose duty is to triage the alerts, basically figure out what does actually need to be handled and what can be ignored or wait till later or etc. Don't do that. Doing that uh, removes the pressure from the team to have, that has the ability to fix the thing from actually fixing it. Um, it also increases the response time. If you've got a help desk doing this um, and then you've got a problem that needs to be fixed, it just increases the time before the the incident gets the person who can actually fix it from knowing that they need to do so. Um, also, proper warning alerts. Um, there's a state in between everything's working fine and everything's broken. Um, you should know that something is about to break or it has broken, but you've got enough capacity to be able to handle the breakage. Use warnings properly. Warnings should be, oh, I need to fix this problem within the next day or so maybe but they should still be addressed. You shouldn't treat warnings as, oh, hey, this warning happens all the time. Um, we can address it next week or something like that. No, your warnings should be handled urgently, just not, you don't need to wake somebody up in the middle of the night for them. Um, and then use auto resolution. Um, by this, I mean, if your monitoring system is able to detect when an incident has occurred, it should also be able to detect when the incident has gone away. There's a couple of good reasons for this. Um, one, if your on-call is, is on the freeway and they get paged for a system being down or something like that, um, they might need to rush to get home. Um, but if you then automatically clear that alert out, they know, oh, hey, I can slow down. I don't need to break the speed limit anymore. I can take my time getting home. Um, also, if you have a really big critical system go down um, and it generates a ton of alerts, but then that system comes back up and you all those related alerts clear out, but let's say you've got a few straggler alerts. It might be there was a related system that went down, and you know, oh, hey, these alerts are still outstanding. I need to go and fix them. Um, the only other way you can do this is to clear out every single alert and see which ones come back, which means you've got to wait to see what is still broken. 
So use auto resolution. Uh, next, stay out of production. You shouldn't ever, or I shouldn't say you should never, you should rarely ever need to be in the production system, especially not on a daily basis. Um, Make it so that you don't need to be there. Um, aside from the obvious security aspects, um, the more you're in production, the more you're likely to break something. So just you shouldn't need to be in it. There's a couple ways you can approach this. One, set up a working local development environment. At Chewy, we can pretty much spin up our entire system on one laptop, from the database to the storefront application, back end to the monitoring system, to the log aggregation. Everything can be spun up on a single laptop, and anyone can do it. It is very, very simple to use. Um, you actually don't even need to configure anything. You just need to start things up, and the system will put itself together. Um, this is especially good for software development teams, as if your software developers need a database that they can use, they don't have to use a shared database that other people are using. They can use their own database. They don't need to be uh, DB admins to be able to get it up and running. Um, next. Use the centralized logging. Um, this is just another motivation to, or one of the common reasons why you might need to log in the servers is you should, like, don't store your logs in bar log and then need to SSH in the box to get at them. Store them in a centralized logging location so you don't have to SSH into your boxes. Um, this also makes it so that other people who don't have SSH access can read the logs and don't need to bug you for them. Um, kick idlers. Um, by this I mean it, you shouldn't ever need to be a station in the box and then just sit there for hours or days on end. Um, there's obviously security aspects in this, but also waste system resources, and you just you shouldn't need to do it anyways. Um, kill abandoned processes. This one kind of goes into the kick idlers one. Abandoned processes, you've logged off a box, your user is left with the process running on there. Um, again, this just sucks up system resources, and it can be a significant security vulnerability, and stuff like screen or tmux. They shouldn't be running on production systems anyways. So kill those processes off, keep them from running out of control or killing your systems. Um, with systemd, there's a really, really nice way to do this. Uh, I think it's like called kill user processes. It works basically just as I described. Once the user logs out, it kills all the processes. So. Um, communication. Uh, communicate publicly. Um, at, Chewy, we use HipChat, and we have a DevOps team room where all the members of the DevOps team communicate in. And we also have a fair amount of the rest of the company in that room as well, and pretty much all of our communication goes through this room. Um, there's a really couple key benefits you get out of this. One, knowledge transfer. Um, if you have two people talking about a specific product or a specific technology or something like that, somebody else who isn't even involved in the conversation can see the conversation and learn something from it. Two, unexpected insight. If two people are talking about a product or technology or a solution or something like that, somebody else might see the discussion and go, hey, I've got a lot of experience with this. They can chime in and offer their own insight. Faster response. Let's say somebody comes to me asking me to do something, but I'm not at my computer right now. Or maybe I'm not the right person to do it. Rather than having to wait for me to respond to them, Anyone in the room can respond and address their concern. Um, Non-repetition, this is kind of going back to that line. If somebody comes to me with a specific request and I'm not the right person, if they private message me, then I've got to either relay their request to the right person or direct them. And then they have to repeat everything that they just told me. If we spent 15 minutes debugging, trying to figure out, oh, hey, I actually am not the right person to handle this, they basically have to repeat that entire debugging procedure with somebody else. Whereas in a shared room, I can just say, hey, John, can you take a look at what uh, Jane's talking about? And it, nobody has to repeat anything. So it makes it really, really easy to pick transfer, um, transfer conversation. So this is my last slide. Just to talk about a, a little bit of the weird things that we do. Um, we don't use cloud. Um, I have nothing against AWS. Uh, I use it fast. I love cloud. But just at Chewy, it's not the right solution for us. Now, this does mean things make things a little bit differently in that we can't like build an EC2 image and then just deploy it to replace an existing one. Um, it does mean that all of our code that we put out has to be both capable of upgrading an existing system as well as building a new one from scratch. This does mean it's a bit more work, but it also means your code is a little bit more robust and that can handle more scenarios. Um, two, 
we don't use Nagios, Xenos, Dabix, or any of those other tools. Uh, we use InfluxDB. It's a fairly newish technology, um, just released uh, 1.0 in the last year or so. Um, but one of the reasons why I mentioned it is we are a really active contributor to some of the InfluxDB <coughs> tools, specifically their Telegraph tool, which is an agent that runs on systems. Um, this kind of goes back to the, one of the earlier points that I was talking about is uh, use open source projects and contribute to them. Um, this is, we do this a lot. Since Telegraph is a very young tool, has a lot of room for growth, and we contribute a lot to that growth. So it does what we need, but we don't have to maintain it. Um, and then the uh, uh, last one, uh, this is probably the only tool that we have written from scratch. Um, it's basically a load balance management tool which uh, ensures safety of the system so that we don't like remove all the boxes from the pool at once. Um, make sure that uh, when one load balancer goes down, another one takes over, stuff like that. Um, but all the stuff that we do is extending existing tools except for this one tool. So it can be done, it just takes a lot of work. So anyway, that is DevOps at Chewy. So, um, Thank you, Patrick. Um, what we want to do is just bring all our presenters up quickly to have a Q&A um, panel discussion. Uh, this is where the value comes out for you guys to be able to ask any specific questions, um, you know, whether from their experience, from, from their knowledge set. Um, so if we just get all of our uh, speakers up here, we'll just set a, set a table. I'll run into the audience, um, and we can get started. So, anybody have any questions? Raise your hand. All right, right here, Justin. Hey, uh, I actually work in security. Uh, I'm a manager for security ops team. It's cool. I work closely with our DevOps team. We're good friends. But I'm wondering, from your perspective, um, and for other DevOps and security folks out here, what experiences have you had that have resulted in good relationships between your DevOps and security teams? either bringing DevOps culture to the security teams or picking up key learnings from the security teams and bringing it back to your DevOps uh, environments? Great question. Um, so our security team is actually pretty small, but um, uh, what, I should kind of think of how to answer this question. So. Um, Part of, uh, oh hell, um, <laughs> well, uh, um, just be honest. Just consider a social idea. <laughs> um, we've actually got a pretty good relationship with them in that we tend to consider security first and foremost in that we don't think of it as an afterthought. A lot of the stuff that we design and implement, we actually consult them on how they would like it to be implemented. Um, basically, ask for their input. Um, they don't have actually access into our systems. We give them visibility into things so that they can see things, but we don't let them touch anything. And they're generally happy with that. They don't ever like need, hey, give me SSH access to your, to your system. As long as we kind of prove, hey, we're doing this, and let them see that we're doing it, they're generally happy with that. So, um, do, do, does your security team have the skill set if they wanted to? To, uh, like, let's say they had a security feature request for your environment, do they have the skill set to actually come in and say, you know what, you guys are really busy trying to release this thing, this sprint, okay. we're going to come in and implement this security thing? Uh, no, right? no, pretty much that would be a DevOps responsibility. So if they, they wanted us to use a specific technology or something like that, they would submit their request to us, they put in the requirements for it, what they want to see out of it, but then DevOps would implement it. Len, Len, let me add one, 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 one thing to that. Obviously, it's a jumping in there. All right. Yeah, <laughs> just figure just to add one thing. Um, security teams, networking teams, system engineering teams, right? These are folks that have deep skill sets in those areas, right? Your DevOps team is like the ninjas, right? They can actually help all of these guys in a certain way because they understand multiple things together. So yeah, they're a hard, like, important resource. 
So if you have a security team that comes in and they start doing something and you think they might have the skill set, but then they might do something that a system engineering team says, well, actually, that's not the way we do stuff. Right? The whole point of DevOps is they actually know how everybody does it, and they can tie the glue together. So in fact, what you want to do is you want to enable them to do it, requirements, everything. You might come there and like, sit next to them and like, help, but the hands to keyboard should be DevOps. So, so actually, a follow-up question. Uh, sorry, I can speak for you. Well, there's uh, sort of like other okay, things. So. Um, uh, to your point earlier, when during your talk about having uh, uh, multi-functional multi teams, which uh, um, I completely agree with, um, uh, are security engineers part of those teams? Yeah. So <laughs> we have, I don't know what happened to the second stuff. Yeah. So let's say you are taking a specific system or component of your system to be up to spec with, say, PCI compliance. You may have one of the security folks on your development team that had, that's you know, called for their agile process, their sprints, that are building stuff, and there's enough security work that you want to actually put that person physically on the team for a bunch of sprints. Absolutely. But the oversight and the code reviews that these guys are doing, there should be oversight and code reviews from the security architect from the security team, right? So, so on some level. Sure, exactly. Now, different people organize differently. That's why I like to you know, be careful not to be too prescriptive. But the point is, you, like, th this is the self-organization part, right? It's like, hey, I need the security stuff, right? And I need to build these things. Like, how do I put people together in the best way that works for your work? Absolutely. Yeah. So, what you, want, what you don't want to do is you don't want to do tickets back and forth and, like, right? Yeah. That's, that's the thing you're trying to avoid. Right. Yeah, you made a great point. I think, first off, just anecdotally on the first point, um, it's, I have, there was a large carbon website named after a residence that I was a tech lead for, we can just leave it there, um, and the security team there had never dealt with automation at the systems level. So they loved me, right, because he, they gave me a list of controls and I said, I can demonstrate that all these controls are always enforced. Um, and I think that was a, like, that was just, that was a valuable lesson for me of like getting into that frame of mind. I mean, one of my biggest achievements there was one security guy said to me, security guys like us, like when starting a conversation, and I was thinking, I'm a developer who's like, you know, reading up on what I need to talk to you about the night before. But um, <laughs> it was, um, but it was really a, you know, understanding what matters across the two teams is the most important thing, right? They can, you know, Understanding what a control is about, understanding why a technical control is better than a process control, uh, being able to explain that what you're doing that you'd call, you know, DevOps is actually putting, able to put a lot of, make a lot of process controls into technical controls. Uh, it's a really valuable thing. Um, and then the other thing in terms of team structure, um, I think that we find that having security people both contributing to a backlog as if the same as the product owner. Um, so that those features, those become necessary, security items become necessary features that are prioritized with the other product features is really valuable. I also think that when we have someone from security sort of rotating in and pairing with a team, that this uses that skill, right? So it, you know, security folks may not be strong developers, but if they're pairing with developers, asking the right questions as they go, rotating from pairing with different developers as time goes on, they're spreading that knowledge into that team so the team will be more secure. So we're, we're actually at the very beginning of this. Uh, I was in a meeting, two hour meeting today about exactly this topic. Um, and, we, and so it's great to hear what you, you guys have gone through. Uh, we're trying to figure it out ourselves. Um, the security people that we have on, on staff right now are not DevOps engineers. They're, and they're not engineers, but they're more compliance on the compliance side. So uh, we work with them and in, in concert with them, but we're not. They're not necessarily jumping in and and uh, developing stuff. I, mean, I said security engineer because there's a difference between okay. you know somebody there to you know be your nanny versus yeah. somebody who actually can help you achieve what you're looking for. Sure. Hi. Um, so I think it was 
Mishka, you mentioned path all the way up the chain in the company. And I was wondering if you and, and any of the other presenters can talk a little bit about what, what, what does that look like in practice? Sure. Thank you. Um, let me give a simple version. So we have managers, we have directors, right? So our principal engineers are on the exact same level as the directors. Same everything. Our directors will eventually manage like 40 to 60 people as we grow up. Uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. So, it's that level. so principal engineers are at that level. In terms of everything, right, tops, whatever, like same level. Um, and then there's a path up. There's a path further up. There's a couple more steps. We don't have anybody at those levels yet. Has growth ability, right? But the point is, like, that's the whole idea. And we have a way for people to sort of continue growing. And you saw some paths, like, I think Pivotal had this line, right? Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 there's a, you know, some companies have, like, this, yeah, the distinguished to, like, C level, like, you can go all the way up. And you see company, like, if you really want to see how this looks at a bigger company, right, that already has, like, we have 100 engineers, we're going to have 100 soon. So we thought this through at the beginning. But you can actually go and look at how the Facebooks, the Googles, the Yahoo's of the world, or the Yahoo, the, 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 <laughs> the Amazon's of the world are organized, right? Um, and you will see that all those companies, they have a path for technologists to go all the way up. They all call it differently, um, but they all have a path, right? And the titles actually don't matter. What matters is, is that you have a way to grow. The most important thing is you don't have a single people say like, you want to make more money? Become a manager. Like the moment that's said, that's the problem. Like who cares? Well, that's like the ladders. The, the point is you have to be able to always grow. You know, responsibility and capability and everything else. And the company should be like helping foster that. Does that answer your question? Well, I guess I, I wonder, what do you mean by growing other than that the salary brackets keep increasing? What does it look like to take out more responsibility? Right, but very valid question. So, no, 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 it's a very good question. So, what's your title today? Perfect. What has to happen in your company for you to be fired? So, when you come up with that, then think about for somebody further up in titles, what more can they be fired for? Like literally, simple way, right? Like you have more responsibility, whatever that is, right? But literally, like, I don't know, like different companies have different stuff, right? You have more responsibility over more stuff, like more goes wrong. You have to look after more stuff. You, you know, you might automate something for 20 teams instead of one team, so that anything goes wrong in any one of those teams is, you know, you're held to the fire. Does that make sense? Does that help? I mean, I exaggerated for a fact. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, 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 let's do this. Right? I like that. We can take it offline. So, everybody's organized differently. There's no like specific answer. The point is, you take one more responsibility. Like, what that looks like an organization is hard for me to say. Right. So like what's like for example, like what's the difference from a principal to a senior in your world? Like like it matters, right? If you don't know it's not well defined, well that's a separate issue, right? Um so yeah, Mishka had said a lot of great stuff there. Uh, one thing I'd say is uh, just to kinda add to it is that management is a different role than uh, than engineering principles and, and so you, you need to really, your career grid ladders and what you value need to kind of show that. Um, and so that's one thing. And the second thing, um, the way kind of to answer your question is the way we show growth, I guess, is impact within the organization. You kind of mentioned this, right? But like, you know, you might define the API standards or the APIs for one group, you know, as a senior engineer, but as a principal, you would be doing it for multiple groups, and that's kind of how we we've kind of distinguished between principals and and senior engineers, at least at level of analytics.
who was it who, who asked the question? As your, it's an old, old idea, authority, accountability, and responsibility should be tied together. So as your accountability and your responsibility goes up, your authority has to go up in order for you to do your job right. And whether you're a technical contributor who's handling bigger problems that impact a larger percentage of the company's infrastructure, or you're a manager who's, infra who's dealing with more of the people and organizational infrastructure, two different paths, perfectly valid ones. Thank you, Ron. So I think everyone has talked about three important topics. One of them is hiring, one other one of them is community, and the other one is organization. So I have three questions, but very quick. Hiring, uh, when finding new talent, look for developers or look for operations people? Whether it's in within the company or from the outside? <sighs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, for organization, <coughs> Um, everybody talks about how you can build community in the same office, but what happens when you have five or six distributed offices through the world? How do you build community? And then the third one <laughs> is about organization. Is it preferable to have an operation, a DevOps team and everybody's funneling petitions into that team? Or do I have a DevOps engineer in each one of my development teams? We'll start off with Chuck on this one. I think it's a big So I don't hire for skill. I'm not managing right now. When I was managing, I never hired for skill. Um, I hire for aptitude. I hire for, um, I think Mishka pointed out a lot of the points about hiring for culture. Um, I hire for behavior. So uh, you can pick up the technical skills. Right? You may be more inclined toward um, operational tasks maybe more inclined toward development tasks, but you can pick up the specifics of those things um, when you're working with team members who already have that experience. Right? And, and we do a ton of pairing, but we advocate pairing for everybody. When you do pairing, um, you know, we need some we need some puppet, we need someone who knows a great way to set up alerts, we need someone who can write a microservice in Java. We put all three of them in a team and if it gravitates towards certain things, but they're going to get much better very better at all of them. Um, organizations, organizations should be around product, period, would be my statement. So some products may be things that you might consider a DevOps product for the organization, right? It, your CICD pipelines, your platform that you deploy to. Um, but I wouldn't, I, I, I think you need, I think it's a Spotify idea, like these communities of practice being sort of equal to the organization. And I think those are important. I think that tribal need that we have, I think that's why also sometimes big companies that were organized by function fail when they try to go cross-functional. And um, it's because people lose that sense of community and that sense of pride of building skills in a particular area. So I think you still need that. It's sort of like almost like a guild mechanism within the organization. Um, what was the third one? Yeah, distributed oh, okay. Um, I think the important thing is to not have these, the, the, not have teams cross office barriers. Right? You get community from people working together. They work better together with 90, 90%. 90. So you hire people to write software. What do you do other than developing code? Sorry, what was that? What's the 10%? Ten, uh, probably about 5% of the operational tasks just through using the software that you write, and then uh, probably 50% debugging. That was the, there's overlap in there. What percent meetings are there? <laughs> <laughs> we probably have about one meeting every week, and then one meeting every other week. Those are the only two regular ones. We do like a stand-up type thing every morning, but I don't know if it qualifies. So Patrick, what tribe would you put yourself in? DevOps. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, the reason I ask is because I, I, my, my inclination would be to say from your talk that you'd say ops, oh, except you write code 90% of the time, and therefore it kind of gets to the point of yeah, you're hiring, it's, regardless, you're it's, hiring. It's a really blurry line, but. An aptitude I'd, and interest. I'd probably say <laughs> to answer one of those questions, do we hire dev or do we hire ops? I would say we kind of don't target the specific one, but the type of people that we end up getting are the devs. And really the reason why I respond that way is we look for the ability 
to design. That's kind of one of the hardest things to find in people is the ability to design solutions, design software. And the people who do that well tend to be the developers. You can find it in the operational people, but it's a lot more rare. Uh, yeah, and the, I was just going to add one more small thing. Is you kept the target. I just, <laughs> yeah, um, the whole point is you hiring teams, right? So it's, it depends on what kind of, it depends on what you're building. By the way, like we're hiring system engineers, we're hiring software developers, we're hiring both, right? Um, and then some people from each group may merge into DevOps at some point, right? That's kind of like the simple way. But the whole point is that operational folks, if you have the right environment, will be doing a lot of development. Cool, so I'm gonna take this opportunity to grab the mic. Um, because I really wanna punctuate on this idea of hiring for culture and hiring for aptitude. Um, that really pushes my buttons, I'm just gonna tell you that right, right up front. And that's because um, culturally, statistically, it's been shown that men are judged against their potential and women are judged against their previous experience. Um, and when you talk about culture, again, you want to go to work and like everybody that you work with, there are some cultural gender-based barriers to that work sometimes. So I would love for you to comment on how you handle that at your organizations. Boom. <laughs> Culture is often used as an excuse for reinforcing your biases. Um, you know, you think about you think culture means do I want to have a beer with this person? Do I want to have coffee with this person? Am I going to want to look at this person for uh, through a fourteen-hour day? And, and you know, fourteen-hour um, day. You know, spend, and, 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 am I going to want to spend that kind of time with that person? Right. Um, and and what when I think of culture, at least what I try to think I'm looking for when I'm thinking of culture is. Um, consistency of values, consistency in, um, and, and the values, the technology values level, right? I think I, I'd like to think that political and human values I have in line with those people who I agree with on the on the technology values, but that's not always going to be the case, <laughs> right? Um, so I think it's it's really checking yourself on the definition of culture when you say culture, um, and I think for aptitude. Um, I would have to say that I'm conscious bias in my judgment of aptitude, um, just because I'm, I'm a realist. Um, but I try to be aware of my biases, um, and, it, and it doesn't mean I haven't made bad decisions because of those unconscious biases, but I just try to be, be thinking of them. I start to think when I think someone doesn't fit, you know, and, and it's, um, it's often, sometimes it's a bias that's closer to the surface, right? I, I, if someone, you know, and it can be, you know, someone's really stiff in the way they talk, right? It doesn't even have to be one of the, one of the real sort of deep unconscious biases or biases that we talk a lot about, right? It can be, I don't like to hire people who are stiff in an interview. That person could be perfect for the job, but I'm set against it. Um, I didn't want to hire someone who wore an ugly sweater during an interview once. Um, and I, I, I had to think a lot about how much did that ugly sweater affect my decision about this person's capability? Right? It was, it was, and and I, I got to the point where I said it didn't matter because it was a customer-facing job, and an ugly sweater to a job interview sounded to me like not understanding the context you were going into, which you need to understand when you go work with customers. So I realized it did have an impact in some extent um, in what I was looking for, um, but I thought through that for, you know, well, first of all, it took me about five, ten minutes to get out of it at the beginning of the interview. And then I thought through it a lot when I was evaluating a candidate. Um, and I'm using that one because I know it's a safe one, it's one I'm sure you're aware of. But I'm sure my unconscious bias has come out in the same way. And I have had those experiences, and I have sat back with them, and really wrestled and struggled with them. And hopefully I was made the right decision, but I'm sure not. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to agree first. Um, so it, it's actually interesting. So I think in older organizations, bias starts at the top, if it exists. What's interesting, I'm going to speak on my experience at Chile. Um, 
what I've been very impressed about is the amount of women on the executive management team. So there are two VPs of staff who are chewy. Me and one other person, right? So we're 50% male, 50% female. Not at the same time, right? That's part one. So, and I've only been through six months, so it's actually the leadership that God Chewy softer toward us over the past couple of years was actually driven by one of the best leaders I know, right? And the team has been structured, and the interviews that are happening are actually happening through female leaders. Our VP of product is female, right? So, like, I am very, very impressed at Chewy. I can't take any credit. I've been only here six months, right? This has been a company that's actually from the top making the right decisions in terms of right how you actually grow. Um, now, in the technology field, there's an obvious, you know, there's more men than women in technology, right? I have four nieces, like it matters. Um, and people you know, socially have different biases. I've hired in South America, in Eastern Europe, in Asia, and in the US, East and West Coast. Each of those places is completely different, right? So that's another thing to recognize. Um, there are countries where it's a completely different thing. Um, and some cases worse, better. It depends what you mean by worse and better. Like, it, like it, it, it's very individual. Um, I do think it's a problem, like in general. Um, and I just, like, I've just been impressed how Chewy has been sort of leading the charge and how the organization is growing. So that's sort of my sort of like view of the organizations that I've been learning about. Um, so for us, we have we have specific cultural interviews in our in our, <coughs> and what we try to tease out is the idea is like, would you want to work with this person? But it it's, it's tr it tries to not go beyond like. Do you want to have a beer with this person? It's more of like, would you enjoy working? Like, would you respect their? Would they respect you? Would you have a mutual respect? And so, uh, we we have a couple specific types of interviews that we do to get to get kind of tease that out. Um, but it's not meant to be anything toward towards that, you know. And as we've seen that we're very conscious of that. Um, and it's a, it's been during some of these retrospectives we've done about hiring, we've. Uh, talked about this quite a bit so all right wonderful I think we want to close with that um, <laughs> no it's just a great it, great any point but uh, thank you so much guys thank you big round of applause for all the presenters big thank you to the Chewy team to Nuska uh, for putting this all together guys a big uh, thank you to all of you um, for continuing support and uh, all your community awareness Everyone have a great safe night. Let's be, um, you know, good, uh, good um, members and get this place cleaned up if uh, we want to leave it the way we found it. Um, and I think uh, for anyone interested, everybody can head down to uh, Tavern Road for some uh, continued drinks. All right. Thank you so much, guys. Thank <laughs> you.